Welcome to UCI Illuminations. I'm Mark Fisher, Professor of Neurology here at University of California, Irvine. And today's Illumination event is focused on the classic TV series, The Prisoner. In the summer of 1968, I was home on a Saturday night mindlessly flipping through TV channels when suddenly I encountered something so strange and so compelling that more than 50 years later, I'm still talking about it. What I encountered was, of course, the television series, The Prisoner. And I know that many of you in the audience today had a similar reaction when you first saw the series, a series that appeared to be a surrealistic, Kafkaesque spy thriller. Information. Whose side are you on? That would be telling. We want information. 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 You won't get it. By hook or by crook, we will. Who are you? The new number two. Who is number one? You are number six. I am not a number. I am a free man. <laughs> I was initially drawn to the superficial mystery of the series. Who are the captors of the prisoner? Us or them? Much later, what became more important were the deeper questions raised on the nature of personal responsibility and victimization, as exemplified in the final image of each episode, when the prison bars slammed shut on the face of the prisoner. The imagery of the series was so striking that I knew I had to capture some of it. And so during that era before video cassette recorders, I would set up my Minolta single lens reflex on a tripod in front of our TV set and fire away. The series received such a strong reaction locally that it was shown in Los Angeles almost every year for a decade. And 10 years after it was initially shown, 
the local public broadcasting station, KCET, decided to show the series with a twist. They brought in a commentator, an esteemed psychiatrist psychoanalyst from UCLA School of Medicine, Rod Gorney, author of the highly acclaimed The Human Agenda. Rod proceeded to give opening and closing remarks on all the episodes. Here is his first commentary on The Prisoner from 1978. Welcome to The Prisoner. And now, your host, Dr. Rod Gorney. I don't believe it's possible for an ordinary person to view an episode of The Prisoner without experiencing strong feelings, maybe of anger or joy or anxiety. Hello, I'm Dr. Rod Gorney, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine. A few weeks ago, I was asked by this station, how would you feel about doing a commentary each week on the series The Prisoner? I answered, insecure. They wondered if there is anything that would make me feel more at ease. I told them that what I really need up here is someone who is friendly, secure, and who would listen when I talk. The station people said, we think we know what you mean. And I think they do. This is my friend, Boley. I wondered why they want a psychiatrist on the show. And they said, well, it would give the program extra depth to have an academic shrink discuss it. Naturally, I recognize the colloquial term, but in my case, it doesn't seem quite correct. You see, I've published on subjects ranging from the psychodynamics of scuba diving to the vagaries of the menstrual cycle. So among this country's 21,000 psychiatrists, I just might be the only academic stretch. And that's really the basis on which I accepted the job. This series is entertainment, but it is also a penetrating examination of our modern conflicts, societies, lives. I hope you'll be willing to consider with me such important aspects of the programs. The extra concentration may heighten your enjoyment. Getting back to those feelings in response to the prisoner, people who find strong feelings too uncomfortable can push them down and out of sight whether stirred up by the prisoner or something else. But because the feelings are outside of awareness doesn't mean that they don't exist or don't affect us. And long, sad experience in psychiatry and in life in general shows that it is usually much safer as well as more satisfying to be aware of strong feelings so that we can make a conscious choice of what to do about them rather than letting feelings control us from someplace off stage. From the individual viewpoint, Viewing fine drama, such as The Prisoner, can be a precious opportunity. One of the essential functions of superb art is to rouse our feelings in a safe situation so that we can let ourselves experience them and gradually come to understand the connections between them and the emotions, ideas, and events in our ordinary experience to which they are related. So, instead of trying to ignore the strong and sometimes uncomfortable feelings that these fine plays may provoke, you might consider focusing on them. Keep a pencil and paper in hand. Some amazing connections and new understanding may come to you. Each week, we'll share the trials of a man caught in variations of his loss of freedom as a prisoner of a frightening, sinister power. In these discussions, before and after, we will try to empathize with his reactions, and then secondarily, we will try to separate ourselves enough away from the chilling events of the programs so that we can understand our responses but not so far that we are unable to grasp their relationships to our own lives. And in this process, we must continually remind ourselves that tenderness and truth and trust are as much a genuine part of the human scene as are terror and tyranny. From the standpoint of society as well, viewing the prisoner may also be a precious experience. Television drama is one of the powerful influences that can help decide the fate of our imperiled species. With its enormous audiences simultaneously affected, it can desensitize us with cheap thrills and divert us from the real adventure of life, as well as increase our awareness of and zest to do what is necessary to rescue ourselves. By the way, the effect of television drama is not confined to children. Our research suggests that adults too are profoundly affected. And remember, it is we grown-ups who run the world, including its prisons and its freedoms. 
Does all this seem an awful lot to digest in a short time? A colleague once commented that listening to me talk is like trying to swallow a spoonful of powdered coffee. Because I so much value these few minutes with you, I may sometimes overpack them. If so, I hope you'll help me out by smoothing the swallow a little with some hot water of your own. One more thing. While I can't guarantee that everything I say will be correct, I can promise that I'll always think so. And by directing my flashlight through the swamp McGowan has in store for us, maybe I can even console you for all those lost commercials. Okay, Bully, I think we are ready for the first day in the life of the prisoner. I was struck by the brilliance of Rod's commentary. And about 25 years later, I finally met Rod and we became friends. We planned a symposium that, with luck, might feature a guest appearance by our hero, series actor and creator, Patrick McGowan, who lived locally. And while that did not come about, I had the opportunity to present some of our thoughts on the series at the 2010 annual meeting of the International Society of Political Psychology in a presentation with the unlikely title of The Prisoner and the Banality of Enlightenment. Rod is now retired, living comfortably in the hills of Brentwood, and for today's event, he has graciously agreed to give us some updated comments on The Prisoner. Here is Rod Gorney. Hello. The Prisoner has always been a vastly impressive achievement in my estimation. It combines drama and currency, and it offers an opportunity for viewers to raise questions which daily life often doesn't give you a chance to think about. My original reaction when I was asked to do these commentaries was, um, new, this is a nuisance. Over several decades, I had become a common uh, individual member of the faculty of the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA, uh, called upon to uh, be interviewed about some subject that Channel 28 was considering. And so I realized that this was one of those invitations that was now a habit. I was startled to realize that this was not the usual experience. It was not the ordinary experience. It was fabulous creative art. And I became immersed in trying to understand the various episodes that I was watching. And so I became really delighted to have an opportunity to comment on each episode of this wonderful television experience. That was an exception in my experience uh, to the response that I had when I encountered what it was that I was asked to comment about. And so I welcome now this opportunity so many decades after 
first considering what the prisoner was communicating and what I thought I could say in commenting about it. When Mark asked me to participate and I saw what I had missed before, I became really devoted to giving it my best consideration. And I welcome the opportunity now to review those comments that I put together so many decades ago. Let's take a look at some of those. This is the introduction of my commentary based on what I was able to view and consider when I was shown the first episode of The Prisoner. Mark, I think that suffices for my contribution to this particular uh, review of the prisoner. And so I would uh, yield my further time to whomever you nominate. Well, thanks, Rod. One of the great bonuses in developing this event was the thrill in my meeting Catherine McGowan, daughter of the legendary Patrick McGowan, actor and creator of The Prisoner. Catherine's mother was stage actress Joan Drummond, and as a teenager, Catherine made her own home movies, and her first job was a production assistant on the popular TV series Jason King. Peter Weingard was the star of that series, and he later went on to play number two in The Prisoner. After an acting opportunity came her way, she knew that was the career for her. She moved to Los Angeles, where she has lived and worked for most of her adult life. And there she studied with Howard Fine for many years and was a longtime member of Theodore Neo. Her credits include three award-winning productions at the Tiffany Theater, and other notable performances include Maria Callas in Masterclass and Allison Look Back in Anger. She has fond memories of working with Lee Remick on one of her last films of Pure Blood. Her guest role on Gilmore Gills is a favorite, and she shared a special acting experience working with her father on an, ep on an episode of Columbo. Her feature film credits include roles in Something's Gotta Give, Kate Beckinsale's Mother in Laurel Canyon, a congresswoman in Evan Almighty, and James Garner's daughter in The Ultimate Gift. She can be seen in the documentary, In My Mind, a retrospective of The Prisoner produced for the 50th anniversary of the series. And most recently, she read a series of short stories by the acclaimed Irish writer, Edna O'Brien, and starred in the short film, Tea with Alice. Catherine lives in Los Angeles and shares her life with her husband of 40 years, Cleve Landsberg, a TV and film producer, along with her two daughters and four grandchildren. She continues to work in the entertainment business. And so here is Catherine McGowan. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, first of all, uh, Mark, I, I just very quickly, I want to thank UC uh, Irvine for hosting this amazing event. I want to thank you, Mark, Alex, and Rod for both being here. Uh, 
your in-depth analogy of the series uh, is, an, is an, an amazing contribution. And I thank you very much. And Rod, what you just said uh, really encapsulates why, why we are here. Um, I, I want to say that last night I thought about the word illuminations. And I thought how appropriate that word is for today because it's really about lighting up shedding light on something that needs to be talked about. Um, I know, I can only imagine, but I do know that my father would feel um, deeply touched that we're here today, 53 years after he first started filming. Why is that 53 years? And the fact is he wanted to stimulate conversation. He wanted to stimulate the thought process. He wanted discussions. And this is exactly uh, why, why we're here. Now I know there are a lot of fans. Uh, we've got a wonderful turnout. Most of you have seen the series, I'm assuming. Some of you may not. So what I'm going to say is I want to just encapsulate and I'm going to leave the facts and the analysis to Alex because he's done a beautiful job in his book. What I want to focus on is the, is the beating heart of the series. It's a conception, how it came about, why it still speaks to us in such a profound way, especially now, given our world of today. Um, so I, ha I jotted down a couple of thoughts. I, I kind of wanted to do this off the cuff, but I thought it better that I would referred to some notes. Um, I feel that um, uh, why, why are we so fascinated by the series? When it first was broadcast, there had never been anything else like that on TV. It was uh, completely original, unique. Uh, nothing had ever been seen like that on television. It was stylistic. It, it, um, it was a, a visual feast. I remember when I saw the Blu-ray that beautiful box set, uh, which was distributed by network for the 40th anniversary. And I saw the series again, after many, many, many years. I saw it on a big screen and I was literally had goosebumps. Uh, and you, I know you shared, Mark, I know you shared that opening sequence I never get tired of that opening sequence. And uh, it is, it's so powerful and it sets up each episode in such a de definitive way. We know that we're going to learn something new this episode. And um, now when it first aired, I, I won't lie, it was very controversial. Uh, there were a lot of people that didn't understand it. They scratched their heads. They, uh, they, 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 they were confused. It, it took a little time to take off. But gradually, as it was re-shown and people got to see it again, they began to step into that world 
step into the possibilities of being challenged, of um, doing a little bit of self-analysis, because in many ways, number six was always in the motion of self-discovery. And um, over the years, I've had the pleasure of meeting many people who have shared their stories of why um, they're such a fan. And the one thing I hear over and over again, they say, oh, you know, I was a teenager. I was 16, 17, 18. I was going through a tough time. I just, I didn't fit in. I was um, depressed. And then I watched the prisoner and all of a sudden things made sense. All of a sudden, I felt like I belonged. All of a sudden, I felt that there was somebody there who was, um, who was uh, behind me, who was fighting for me. And over and over again, uh, I've, I've heard that, uh, that seeing the prisoner have, has helped many people get themselves on course. So it, it speaks in many different ways. It speaks in an, in an intellectual way. It speaks in a metaphysical way. It speaks to the heart, I think, of in, in all of us. So um, for, for others though, for others like us here today, um, we are not alone. We are the like-minded. We are here today because there is something in the prisoner that we understand and that we have connected with and that we, we are on board. Let's say that we, we've taken the path that the prisoner has taken us on. So, um, The series we aired, it, it first aired in yeah. UK and America in 78. And, that, and Rod, that is when you did your uh, b b beautiful commentaries on PBS. Um, I have often used the term when, when lightning strikes. And uh, I've talked about this before. And I, I strongly believe, um, yes, the series was carefully crafted, carefully thought out, every aspect of it, from the wardrobe, the costumes, the uniforms, the, look, the retro look of all the sets, uh, it was that other world feel, and that was all brilliantly done and very well thought out. But none of this would have been as effective as it was if one thing hadn't happened. And that is um, Port Miriam, the location of Port Miriam, which is in Wales. Many of you know it, many of you have been there. And I have always said, there is no prisoner without Port, Port Miriam or vice versa. How do you create a series around a village, the village, the island, the place of isolation um, and I think lightning struck when my father discovered Port Miriam and then the idea and the connection of how could one build a series using this unbelievable place. Um, it, 
I don't believe it was built with the series intended, but it ended up being the perfect location, the perfect set to offshoot, to be a backdrop, because it has every quality that you need to um, tell the story. And that feeling of isolation and that feeling of where am I? Have I been put in a capsule and, and propelled to another world? So um, the two became one and then the magic started. And I do think there was a lot of magic that happened with, with the prisoner. <clears throat> I don't think my father would say accidents, but I think things happened and you go with it in the moment. So just like a jigsaw puzzle, things fell into place. And then we have checkmate. Um, so after all this time, 53 years, it, 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 it's remarkable. It has retained its originality. There have been some who've tried to copy. There have been some who've tried to steal some of the premise, and that is fantastic. But it is still stands on its own. There, there, there's nothing else that really compares. And audiences are still fascinated. They're still enamored. And in some ways still addicted. So I ask, why is it still so relevant? Why is it not dated? Why is it still an extraordinary piece of entertainment? that doesn't compromise itself in any way, shape or form. It doesn't fit into any category because it's its own category. So it was intended, as my father said, to be an allegory. And what is an allegory? It's a, it is like a narrative. It's a device that conveys hidden meanings through symbolic figures, actors, images. It can be spiritual, it can be moral, it can be political. But it leaves a, a world of possibilities open. Um, so uh, another thing that is so powerful is the themes, the running themes that run through each episode. Now, each episode is unique, as we know. You have a different number two, uh, except for Leo, Leo McKern, and, but for the most episodes, there's a, a, a new number two. So the themes of the prisoner. Is it a cautionary tale of things to come? My life is my own. I am not a number, I am a free man. So is there always the threat, that the threat that the prisoner has lost his freedom, has lost his peace of mind? So these were con controversial and thought, thought provoking ideas in what was supposed to be a spy drama and it was and it wasn't it was that and more um always pushing the envelope always pushing the audience a little further each episode pushing a little further because i think that the series respected the audience. I know that my father took tremendous responsibility 
each week coming into your home to entertain. He thought that responsibility weighed on him and he didn't want anything that wasn't weighted or had a little bit of gravitas. So saying all that, um, there, there are many other things and Rod articulated this beautifully in his commentary. Um, there is the, the question of one's own mortality, one's own moral compass, the good and the bad in all of us. Um, so um, we'll get into later on, I'm sure Alex will deal with this, the always questioning authority and um, what, uh, what happens, um, what does power do to the human ego and what happens when power is put into the wrong hands. These are all questions, possibilities. Um, I've always, um, just a little backstory very quickly, and I know I'm on a time crunch, so Mark, if I'm going over, let me know, okay? Um, just a quick backstory on the, uh, the heart and soul and the vision of, of the man. He always lived with these bigger than life ideas each and every day. This wasn't something that he concocted in a year. It wasn't something he con concocted after he did Danger Man and then segued into the prisoner. The, these ideas, it had been percolating since he was a very young man, growing up in rural Ireland, and in Sheffield, um, he often said that his humble beginning provided a clean canvas on which to place his thoughts and questions and see the world with clarity. He was a student of life. Um, and in saying that, I um, like what, I'll follow up what Rod had said, I, for me and for most fans I know, I believe that the prisoner should be experienced on a visceral level. It poses the question in all of us, who am I? Where do I fit in? Where is my village? And how do I exist with an independent spirit? Now I would say that the prisoner was deeply personal to my father, although he was asked that question in an interview and he declined to say that. But I know it was because there are things in the prisoner that are one and the same to the father that I knew. There, um, you can look at number six, Number six has a fire burning within, at times volcanic. He was driven, filled with conviction, sinister, sarcastic, defiant, rebellious, and fiercely independent. And all these qualities were naturally, naturally inhabited my father. So I believe that audiences related to number six because of this. It was as if uh, he was fighting for them, for, for the good of all people, fighting to get the truth, like, like the anti-hero. So I, I think that's why audiences are still wanting more from the series because I think there's something in themselves that they see in number six. So in wrapping this up, because I know Alex is waiting in the wings here, um, 
I heard that they just aired The Prisoner in England. Somebody told me they just watched it again. And I thought to myself, what perfect programming for this time in COVID, in the COVID world. I don't think anyone of us could have predicted this. Um, I know that a lot of us are going through a rough, rough time. Um, but it, it resonates today as much as ever. And moving forward, we don't really know what we're moving forward to, do we, right now? Is there going to be a new industrial revolution where there will be, where AI will, will be part of our everyday existence? What applied 53 years ago still applies. And I think the themes of the prisoner, um, and this is something that my mother articulated so well on the 50th anniversary. And I'm going to quote very quickly what she said, because I think it just encapsulates this moment. She said on the 50th anniversary, I know that Patrick would say and would feel that the more we are becoming dehumanized, the more important it is to hang on to our independent spirit. And so that said, I just wanted to pose a couple of questions or thoughts. And I just wanted to say, so we are uh, in a world right now that's pretty torn apart. We are tracked, monitored, recorded, under surveillance, stamped, numbered. Sound familiar? <laughs> Is freedom a myth? Are we all prisoners of our own ego? and living in our own village. And I'm going to pass the mic on. <laughs> there you have it, Mark. <laughs> Catherine, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, it, it's an honor to introduce to you our featured speaker, Alex Cox. Alex's book, I Am Not a Number, has been called The Best Guide to the Prisoner. Now, I've been in academia for more than 40 years, and I've seen a lot of CVs. But Alex has what is undoubtedly the coolest CV I've ever seen. Alex studied jurisprudence as an undergraduate at Oxford, has been on the faculty at University of Colorado, and has lectured at UCLA and the Royal College of Art in London. Alex has directed many acclaimed films, including Sleep is for Sissies, Repo Man, Sid and Nancy, Straight to Hell, Walker, Death in the Compass, Three Businessmen, Revengers Tragedy, Searchers 2.0, Bill the Galactic Hero, and Tombstone Rashomon. He is also the author of the books 10,000 Ways to Die, The President and the Provocateur, Alex Cox's Introduction to Film, and X Films, True Confessions of a Radical Filmmaker. Alex's credits as a screenwriter include Keith Moon Was Here, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and Mars Attacks. He has multiple credits as a stage director and many credits as an actor. He has written multiple graphic novels and comic books, including four episodes of Godzilla, King of the Monsters. He has written a long list of articles, including I Was Dennis Hopper's Henchman, The 10 Best On-Screen Deaths of All Time, Directing, a Movie Star Substitute for Psychoanalysis, 
A Bullet in the Back, The Demise of the Western, and Stanley Kubrick, Exile on Main Street. Alex has been interviewed for the film Stanley Kubrick, A Life in Pictures, and his awards include the Dennis Lee Hopper Award at the Albuquerque Film Festival and a Fulbright Fellowship. Articles about Alex include The Filmmaker Too Tough to Die from the Boulder Weekly, Alex Cox, Revolutionary from the Los Angeles Times, I Shopped with a Zombie from the Critical Quarterly, and the book, Alex Cox, Film Anarchist. And here is Alex Cox. Wow, well, thank you for that, that very lovely um, introduction. Very kind. I, I, um, like the previous speakers, I just want to thank Illuminations. And I want to thank you. And I want to thank Professor Lupton for inviting us all here to talk about the prisoner. Um, like the others, I first saw this a long time ago. I first saw it you know, on British TV in late 67 and in 1968. And like Catherine and Rod and Mark, I found it just extraordinary. Something I had never contemplated ever seeing on television. And it was revelatory and it changed my life and, and made me want to do things like that, if, if such a thing was possible. Um, so I'd like to do a little poll because I wonder we have 143 odd participants. Um, I think we're set up to do a poll because I'm interested to know how many of you actually have seen The Prisoner. Um, you know, maybe you haven't seen all the episodes, but have you seen it? If so, you know, tick the box yes. If you haven't, tick the box no, and then I will know something about the people to whom I'm speaking. Excitedly awaiting for your responses. And I guess the tech, the technological persons monitoring all of this, aha, yes, 95% of those present have seen the prisoner and only 5% have not. Excellent. So, um, so I'm sorry if this may seem a little arcane and strange to people who haven't seen the show, but hopefully you will be so interested by uh, what I am and the other speakers have said and by the clips that we have shown that you will be, you will race urgently to that, that boxed set of DVDs or Blu-rays and, uh, and watch the show. Um, I'm gonna show the same introduction uh, as Professor Fisher showed, um, but slightly differently because I'm going to show it you the way we saw it um, in England when the show was first screened. And so if we show my first clip, can we show it with the audio down a bit so that I can talk my way through it? And we can look at that clip. So this is what the prisoner looked like when I first saw it on British television on a small screen, four by three aspect ratio, black and white. This was the prison as we knew it, when it was first screen. But wait, there's more. Because Lou Gray, and insist on the to make this in color And so what we're looking at now in a funny way is goodbye to the black and white scene of Danger Man and Hello to this fundamentally beautiful color. The man behind the desk the new author, the man to whom the prisoner presented the designation. And I imagine probably quite a few of you know who that was, that individual. It was George Markstein, the story editor, 
and um, the story of the, of the previous series of Danger Man. Because all of this stuff came out of a series that McGowan had previously made for Lou Grade and for independent television called Danger Man, or as it was known in the United States, Secret Agent Man or Secret Agent. You remember that song, Secret Agent Man? I think it was probably written to celebrate the Magoon series. Now, Secret Agent Man was a, a show about a spy, sort of a James Bond type thing. And the hardcore that worked on that show went on to make The Prisoner as well. Principal among the, uh, the, the key technical crew uh, was Mark Stein, the story editor. What we call him now would be the showrunner, but I don't think he had quite the power of a big time uh, Los Angeles showrunner today because he was always working, collaborating with McGowan who was star, executive producer, and uh, uh, writer, and indeed the de facto editor of most of the episodes. There's, uh, there's Tony Wingard as uh, number two in this episode. David Tomlin, the producer, was another key element. He had been the assistant director and the second unit director on uh, Danger Man, and he produced this entire series and later episodes, he was also uh, the director. That clip is over now, so you can see my smiling face again if you would like. Excellent. So we have a key, uh, a key team consisting of Mark Stein, David Tomlin, Jack Champan, who was the production designer, the art director of uh, Danger Man. He left television to go and work in feature films, and he had just done a film for Joe Losey called Modesty Blaze. But Magoon called him back and said, look, I'm doing this new series, come and be the art director. And he did. The series was shot by uh, Brendan Stafford, who had shot all of Danger Man. And there was a guy called Frank Maher, who was the double and the fighter ranger in Danger Man. And also, uh, uh, excuse my dog here. I, I like uh, Rod, have a, a small animal at my feet. Um, and she does tend to growl and snarl occasionally. Not as good as Rod's dog. Anyway, um, so we've got a key team consisting of Mark Stein, Tomblin, Champin, Stafford, Maher, who was also, in addition to being the fighter ranger, was a kind of a confidant of Magoon's, and Rose Tobias Shaw, the only woman in the equation who had cast 87 episodes of Danger Man and all the episodes of The Prisoner. So the key creative team of the prisoner was that, plus one other individual, must not forget Lou Grade, the financier, the person who made it all possible. Lou Grade, who owned Danger Man, who owned all the series of Danger Man and wanted more. And McGowan um, came to him and said, I want to pitch you something else. I don't want to do another series of Danger Man. Um, now, Gray didn't take written submissions. He wouldn't read a written pitch or anything like that. So apparently, the story goes, at a 6 a.m. meeting, McGowan sat down with Gray and told him the story of the prisoner, uh, which he said would be shot in Port Marion. He had photographs of Port Marion to show Gray. And Gray was familiar with Port Marion because they'd shot a couple of Danger Man episodes there. Um, so he said, OK, we'll do it. Um, but I want it shot in 35 millimeter. I want it all in color because we're going to sell this one to the Americans and they want color. We don't know if McGowan's pitch included the idea that number six was John Drake, Danger Man. Um, certainly some people did believe the series was the further adventures of John Drake. And one of those was George Markstein. Either way, on September the 6th, September the 6th, 1966, the cast and crew got together at Paddington Station in London, took a train up to Crewe, changed trains, and went on to Wales, to Port Marion, to begin a journey of discovery whose meaning and destination were not known. And I think that's important because as the series developed, as the series was being made, a rift developed between McGowan and Mark Stein, the story editor. Um, 
And my take on the series is that we can only begin to understand the prisoner in story terms if we watch it in the order in which the episodes were filmed. Because nobody knew at the outset of the prisoner how it was going to end. The story developed and in certain ways changed quite drastically as the shoot progressed. So my argument is that rather than watch the episodes in the traditional broadcast order, which tends to change anyway, we should watch them in the order in which they were shot. And that's a little difficult because they weren't all shot in one piece. There was shooting at Port Merion, there was shooting at MGM Studios in London on the soundstage next to the soundstage that 2001 was using. Um, there was a lot of work to do and putting together the episodes was a complicated uh, process. But in terms of beginning the episodes, this is the order in which they were shot. And for the 5% who haven't seen the show, I apologize for reading out a list of titles. First, Arrival. Second, Free For All. Then Checkmate, Dance of the Dead. The Chimes of Big Ben, Once Upon a Time. The Schizoid Man, It's Your Funeral. A Change of Mind. The General, A, B and C. Hammer into Anvil, many happy returns. Those are the first 13 episodes that were all sort of shot in, in continuity. At uh, the end of that process, there came the realization that there were only going to be four more episodes, that it wasn't going to be another 13 episode season. And so uh, they then shot Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, the episode in which McGowan does not appear, Living in Harmony. The Girl Who Was Death, and Fallout. So that's the order in which the show was made. And I think it, it, it rewards us to look at the show in that way, because while Mark Stein remained committed to the idea that the village was essentially a prison camp for retired spies or for captured spies, such a thing had apparently really existed. Mark Stein had heard about a place called the Inter-Services Research Bureau, which during the Second World War had operated a kind of a private hotel up on the coast of Scotland, where these dubious spies or double agents were incarcerated in, in very nice circumstances, but unable to leave. So Mark Stein thought McGowan's character, number six, is a spy. McGowan, as the show went on, developed an idea which didn't gel with Mark Stein's. Uh, a developing idea, I think, that in fact the prison, or the, or, or the village in which the prisoner was incarcerated, was a scientific research gulag, which is a slightly different thing. For scientists who were encouraged or obliged to continue their work in captivity. Uh, Anyway, after 13 episodes, um, Mark Stein and McGowan's rift was complete. Uh, Mark Stein left the series, and for the last four episodes, McGowan um, was both even more in charge, but also strangely absent, because for a couple of episodes, he was in Los Angeles, simultaneously shooting a now-forgotten action film called Ice Station Zebra. But since the meaning of the prison developed, the prisoner developed over time, um, and the order of the episodes mirrors the development of that meaning, it's quite important, for example, that the second episode be free for all and not the Chimes of Big Ben. There was a tendency to put uh, Chimes of Big Ben second in the broadcast series because it starred an actor called Richard Wattis, who had played. Uh, a regular series character in Danger Man. So the association with Danger Man was reinforced by showing that episode in second place. In reality, second place should be held by three for all. A, a more interesting episode in which um, number six is actually brought into the village apparat and encouraged to stand for election as number two. Um, uh, number two describes him in this episode as a new recruit. So we know this is very, very early on in his village experience. And as an episode, it's fascinating, of course, especially um, as Catherine was saying, the, the contemporary importance of the prisoner 
is definitely visible in an episode which talks about the electoral process, how the villagers can be all G'd up and very excited about the election, but once the election has taken place, they, they turn their backs because they know that really fundamentally nothing will change. Um, it's, a, it's, it, it's a great episode. There, there are so many great episodes, as we know. Um, and in my thesis that we need to watch them all in the order in which they were made, the one episode which needs to be moved out of that sequence is Once Upon a Time, the episode with Leo McKern as number two, in which they go into a deep pit beneath the village and uh, attempt to resolve their differences. Um, once Upon a Time was originally intended, I believe, as the, the cliffhanger episode uh, for the end of the first series, when it would have been episode 13. But when um, it became clear that it was just going to be seven episodes, yeah, then it really took its place as episode 16. And episode 17, Fallout, begins with a reiteration of things that occurred um, in Once Upon a Time. So I hope that makes sense. Um, what I want to concentrate on mostly, though, in this talk is one thing, and it's McGowan's refusal to play a romantic character on television and the casting consequences, um, which, of course, make Rose Tobias Shaw the key creative partner of McGowan in making The Prisoner. Now, some people felt um, that McGowan was approved um, and that it was wrong for him not to want to have a girlfriend in the prison. And Mark Stein felt that way. Um, but McGowan defended his, his choice by saying, look, I'm not approved. If you see me in motion pictures, I, I've played some pretty raunchy characters. Um, but television is different. Television is a mass audience. The show is going to play at like six o'clock in the evening. I don't want grandma turning on and finding me in bed with a girl. You know, that's not what television should be about. You know, so he had a particular position on, on the way television and the, or, and the community should interact. This was a long time ago. Um, but the result of McGowan's decision that the prisoner wouldn't have a series regular girlfriend or a series of girlfriends like Napoleon Solo in, in The Man From Uncle meant that while there were still sexy girls, there were sexy maids and beautiful women and beautiful spies, but there were also serious and powerful characters which had been written for men, which ended up being cast by Tobias Shaw with women actors. And I'd like now to look at a clip from Checkmate uh, where we see one of those characters. understand that you mustn't speak to the patient. Of course. You find this very interesting. The treatment's based on Pavlov's experiments. With dogs? The patient has, or was it rats? With dogs. The patient has been dehydrated. When he wakes, he'll be suffering from an insatiable thirst. Society, one must learn to conform. Nothing to be 
be afraid of? The blue dispenser. struggle. From now on, he'll be fully cooperative. I'm glad. He's given me a lot of trouble. Your troubles are only just beginning. Is he in the treatment? Not yet. Gee. Interesting subject. I should like to know his breaking point. Well, you could make that your life's ambition. So that was Peter Wingard, who was one of the better number twos, and Patricia Jassel as number 23, a role which in the original screenplay was written for a man, a male psychiatrist. Um, she doesn't get a lot to do in that scene. She has a lot more in the way of activity later in the episode, but I just wanted to show that because it's so disturbing and so dreadful. And by doing that kind of casting, of course, they anticipated um, a world an unimaginable world in which a woman who was involved with a campaign of, of, of torture would end up being the head of the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, so it's interesting how things turn out. Um, another clip that I'd like to show you with a, um, an interesting um, number two, originally written for a man, is the following clip from Dance of the Dead. No dancing. Tonight's for dancing. Amongst other things. <laughs> Music, come along. You've been practicing long enough. And dance, enjoy yourselves. It's carnival. I rarely drink. Then you'll enjoy it all the more. Self-denial is a great sweetener of pleasure. It's warmer than we think. Undoctor to carnival. Your administration is effective, though you have no opposition. An irritation we've dispensed with. Even its best friends agree democracy is remarkably inefficient. It's 53. How impressive. From here on, of course, we degenerate to the 55 and the 57, and if people really misbehave themselves to a quite extraordinary 58. Why haven't I a costume? Perhaps because you don't exist. Quite enchanting. Little Bo Peep. Who always knows where to find her sheep. Oh, you must cheer him up, my dear. Dance. It's a special night. We hope so. Dance. A glass of wine, Doctor. Oh, drink is too levelling. How is it? Still rebellious, but it will pass. Without treatment? We don't want to spoil him. Unless we must. Uh, how many of these have you been to? This is my first and last. Don't be silly. Yes. Uh, who's saying that? You or the computer? Me. Just stop stop. Oh, don't behave like a human being. It might just um, confuse people. Only you, know? you are confused. Yeah. They're not for long. There are treatments for people like you. Uh, I've turned the sides. She, uh, she must get instructions. Who do they come from? Is he here tonight? The man behind the big door? Well, there's no need to know. This place has been going for a long time. Since the war. Before the war. Which? For a long time. So since number six wasn't looking for a girlfriend in the village, he gets to have a lot more spirited and interesting interactions with the women characters that he meets. Um, in particular in this episode, uh, with Mary Martin as number two. Again, number two in the script was written as a male character. And that individual turned up at the fancy dress party dressed as Jack the Ripper. Um, anecdotally, I've heard that Mary Martin, when they were talking about what her fancy dress costume would be, said, well, I've played Peter Pan a couple of times, you know, and I can probably still fit in the outfit. And um, Sure enough, she did, and she wore her Peter Pan gear, 
for the episode. Ironically, in British theatre, Peter Pan was always played by a woman actor, just as in pantomimes, um, the Ugly Sisters and the Widow Twanky were always played by men. Um, but it wasn't just sexual role shifting that Tobias Shaw was doing. And another very interesting example of her casting, I think, is the casting of the role of the butler. And in the original script, um, the butler in the script of Arrival is described as very formal, but a man obviously in good physical shape who'd be at home in an E-type Jag, in other words, a fast sports car. Um, in other words, the butler in the original screenplay was a James Bond character, you know, um, and instead they dumped that character and cast the extraordinary Angelo Muscat. Uh, who does not look like James Bond and who plays the role entirely mute. Um, so it's a fascinating casting choice and it worked really well. Um, they enhanced the role of the butler and if you read the script for Once Upon a Time, he's just referred to as Angelo throughout. Um, so casting had an enormous impact on the development of the story. Uh, and with that in mind, I want to talk about a, a very interesting cast, casting choice of another woman actor called Georgina Cookson, who appears in two episodes. Um, first of all, she appears in an episode in which, again, a, a, a malevolent scientific experiment is taking place and number six is being subjected to some very dangerous dream experimentation in order to learn what he knows. And this uh, clip comes from the episode A, B, and C. You have to hurry. Get me C's picture. That isn't one. This is all we have on him. Known to be French, known to have attended Ongadine's party, is probably disguised. Known to have been in contact with number six. How do you expect me to bring them together if there's no picture? It's a process of elimination. C's the only one left. He'll find him. Well, you have to hurry. Champagne. We all need more champagne. Watch him for me, will you, darling? He's the last same man in the world. I like saying that. Are you in business? I was. You're young to retire. Age is relative. Meaning you're free. Possibly. I know something. And the pay is very good. I'm free. Number six. I'm sure it's your lucky number. You just won't play it. The end of our blue. Six, moi, vraiment. Now, again, remember, this is um, a dream. This isn't, um, this isn't really happening, but the prisoner has been seeded this dream. And within the dream, they have presented him with the character played by Georgina Cookson, who brings him good luck, good fortune. Um, two episodes later, she reappears as the lady who owns his house in London when he makes it back there in Many Happy Returns and at the very end of the episode as number two. Now, what does this mean? Is it a casting coincidence or is it something more? Are we suggesting that the village is actually seeding future number twos into the prisoner's dreams as part of its long-term strategy to make him reveal why he resigned? Um, one more thing I want to say briefly about casting quite quickly. Um, is that there is a casting mistake in The Prisoner, which I, I can't justify and I think must have happened just because they were running out of time and desperate for an actor. Um, Patrick Cargill appears in the episode uh, Hammer into Anvil, and he's a very mean number two. He causes the death of a woman at the very beginning of the episode, and number six devotes himself to bringing him down, to, de to destroying him for the remainder of the show. Um, so he's a very striking number two, and his destruction was, was much warranted and, and deserved. Um, but then, a couple episodes down the line, Cargill reappears, cast um, as a minor bureaucrat 
in Whitehall. Um, and it does seem like a mistake. It, it, it's the opposite of the, of the very clever use of Georgina Cooks and, and feels to me like in that instance, they were just stuck for an actor and, and, and cast someone they should not have cast. Um, we think of the prisoner as being so original, so unusual, so strange, so unlike anything that had gone before or anything that came after um, that we don't really think about the series antecedents. And yet, obviously it had antecedents, everything has antecedents besides Danger Man. Um, and I'd like to end with showing you a trailer for a series made in 1961 as a vehicle for the pop singer and entertainer Anthony Newley. Um, he was given a TV show to write and star in, and he called it The Strange World of Gurney Slade. It was unusually big budget for television. It was shot on 35 millimeter film, which was almost unheard of for a British TV show at that time. Um, Network, who, as Catherine pointed out, did such a nice job of, of, of the, uh, the reissue of the Prisoner uh, DVDs and Blu-rays for the 50th anniversary, have also brought out a set of Gurney Slade episodes. There were six in all. And here's the trailer for the DVD that they made, showing the scene in which Gurney Slade resigns from a TV sitcom and literally walks out. Much strangeness ensues. So this is just something that maybe McGowan and his partners had seen, maybe they liked it, um, maybe I'm imagining things. But here, um, to round off my little presentation, is the trailer for Gurney Slade. Be seeing you. Will you have an egg, Albert, or something else? A boiled egg, please, my love. Oh. Oh. A boiled egg, w please, Will you have an love. egg, Albert? A or something else? egg, uh, please, my going love. Going for a walk, Albert? <laughs> yes, going for a Post walk. Post egg on toast? Uh, a boiled egg, uh, please, my love. Have a biscuit. <laughs> a boiled egg, please, my love. Can I see the roses? Albert? A boiled egg, please, my love. What about an egg, Albert? Yes. Oh, no, I could waste a few brains. Give me an egg. On the roses, my love. On the roses. Very good with them. I am a walking television show. I can't get away from them. My name is Gurney Slade. I, uh, I did a television show recently and they didn't think it was very funny. I'm being charged with having no sense of humor. Oh, just watch and keep your fingers crossed. I wasn't supposed to do anything like this. Uh, you say this is the stage, what's it for? It's where we perform the show. You perform the show, of course, of course. Of course, of course, of course, of course. What great air conditioning. You could easily develop a very good, nasty mind, you know. Why don't you go and see one of those French films? There's one on at the Rexy this week. But you're gonna have a party. Let's have a mad party. Why didn't you stop indoors and watch the television? Nothing on, just some bloke telling kids a story. Huh? Well, I hope he's doing better than me. Leave me alone, will you? I got a right to me privacy. I just walked out of all this, I don't wanna know. Now leave me alone. So that's my, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> You're muted, Mark. Okay, can y'all hear me now? It's, uh, thank you, Alex, for a fabulous presentation. And we now have some time for some Q&A, some questions and answers. And we've had a whole series of questions coming in before and during this presentation. 
and just to look at uh, some of these uh, questions there. Uh, there are several questions, one from, uh, from Philip, one from Rhonda in Virginia, and there are some questions about a sequel to the prisoner. What was the considerations, were, what were the plans for a potential sequel to the prisoner that uh, Patrick McGowan may have been working on? Uh, uh, Alex, uh, Catherine, are, are you able to comment on that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll begin and Alex, yeah, you, you can no, you uh, finish. So, um, yes, there was a, a script that my father had been working on. Uh, there were several drafts. Um, and at one point, uh, uh, I think he thought that it, that there was a strong possibility that it would be made. He had even planned a trip back to Port Miriam. Uh, because I think they were going to use that location and beyond. Um, the problems that happened with it is um, we're talking about the late 90s. So we're talking about 30 years after the fact. Um, making movies has changed a lot. And studios that want to finance a movie they want to um, appeal to a broader audience. And so they were committed to making uh, a sort of a blockbuster sequel with uh, a lot of um, special effects, um, a lot of things that in essence were not, was, was not the prisoner. They wanted a, a purely an action sequel and um, something that the new audiences were used to and uh, you know wanted to see. So I know that um, there was some disagreement over the vision and uh, a lot of frustration because the prisoner con continues to be a thinking man and woman's series. It's the series is in quotes for the every man and every woman. And um, I know my father had said, hey, listen, you go make your movie for a hundred million. I can get it done for 10. Uh, that never happened. Uh, there is a script locked in a vault and um, uh, Probably at this point, uh, I don't think it will ever happen. And I don't know if it's meant to happen. Um, I know my mother feels very strongly about this and she has expressed that she feels Patrick is the beating heart of the prisoner. He is the prisoner and there is no other prisoner. So while she's alive, I hope there, uh, it will remain as, as is. I hope that answers a little bit of your question without giving away any of the details of what might be in the script. <laughs> Alex, do you know any more than me? No, you know more than I do. Okay, uh, all, all right. All I know about is the 17 episodes. <laughs> right, okay, very good. I know that uh, we have a group of people that are probably online. Uh, I know we have the six of one, and we may even have a few people from un, un Mutual. They are an incredible resource for the facts, the history behind the prisoner. Uh, they have provided so many fans with uh, memorabilia and they would probably know even more about this than I. So I will leave it in their hands. All right. Looking again at the series of questions. So one from John, which I, I think is on a lot of people's minds, has to do with the interpretation of the very last episode of The Prisoner, Fallout. Uh, there are so many individual elements 
from that particular episode. And I know, Alex, you've uh, commented quite extensively on, on your interpretation of Fallout. And uh, perhaps you could uh, uh, expand on some of your comments and I'd certainly like to hear from Catherine and Rod as well in terms of your take on the meaning of the last desperate episode of The Prisoner, where, as they said, he gets a strange reward for being rebellious and an opportunity to meet number one. Yeah, I mean, my, my take is that he's, um, he's fulfilling the function that he's been sent to the village to perform. Um, when when I, my take is that everything that is said in the village in the village by the characters is is pretty much true, especially everything that he says. So when he tells Leo McKern that he wanted to be the first man on the moon, that could be a joke. You know, he could just be having a funny joke, or he could be making a meta reference to this uh, TV show in which he played a, uh, a lunar astronaut, or he could be totally serious. And my suspicion is that the, um, the, uh, the rocket ship that's under the village is not a nuclear weapon because it has, um, it has a monkey or a, or a monkey with a human face, his face on board. I think it's, it's the first British lunar mission and he's just launched it, thereby fulfilling his function within the ritual of the village. But that's just my idea. So the key word is interpretation. And this is what is unique about the series. It is left completely open to one's own interpretation. That said, um, there was a lot of frustration after Fallout. I mean, this is well known. Uh, because it wasn't conclusive. In many ways, it wasn't conclusive. That was intentional uh, because I believe that the struggle and the journey is continued. Um, do we ever find freedom? Are we always seeking freedom? Um, we discover that number six is when he takes the two masks off and then it's himself. Uh, so many people were disappointed because they wanted, they, they were trying to imagine what actor was going to play number one, who, what, what's gonna be this big, big reveal. And other people said, oh, I've taken this whole journey, 17 episodes, and it's him. And I think you have to look at um, the staging of it. I think you have to look at um, what happens the before and what happens after. And uh, I remember when I watched Fallout again for the very first time after about nearly 30 years, um, I was blown away when the Beatles song came on, All You Need Is Love. And that said, you have the, the song going while, and it's the first time in the whole series that number six uses a device that he's actually against but he knows he has to use it. And that is violence. And that is key because in the end, when you're being rebellious and you are um, making a stand, he knew that that was the only way that he would get out of the village. But then as the episode progresses, the question is posed, is he right back in the village? So a lot of it is intended to be ambiguous because the village is different for all of us. 
number one maybe is the same for most of us, but we have to discover that within ourselves. So it is truly left to the individual interpretation. So I think I'll end with that comment. And uh, Alex or Rod, if Rod has any uh, comment on that, I would be very curious to know. Okay, well, Rod, if you have uh, any further comments, please uh, jump right in. Uh, he's Rod, you're on mute. Okay, well, we'll, we'll have Rod join us uh, with some further comments in just a moment. Rod, are, are you on? Okay, well, well, we'll get back to Rod in, in a few moments. Uh, some questions have come up. Uh, curious about uh, uh, Patrick McGowan's relations with some, uh, some well-known contemporaries during that period. Uh, several questions, one from uh, Emily, uh, one from Michael uh, about his relationship uh, with Orson Welles, that he was in a, uh, uh, in a stage production of Moby Dick um, with uh, Orson Welles and wanted to know, was there any kind of continuing relationship with Orson Welles, number one? Um, and along the same lines, uh, The Prisoner was produced uh, around the same time. And I understand an adjacent studio to the film 2001 by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, and curious whether those two men might have interacted uh, at some point. And uh, Catherine, you might be in the best position to, to comment on, uh, on those items. Well, re regarding Orson Welles, uh, yes, they did um, Moby Dick rehearsed. Um, and that was, uh, it was just a three week run in London. Uh, it was the hot ticket. Every, anybody and everyone wanted to see this. And Orson had great plans to take it on the road and to continue doing it. But um, there, there was a problem with Orson, I believe getting funding and being able to um, get everybody together. And in fact, I think my father, he even visited Orson uh, in Italy, uh, where Orson was working on the sets and um, working to um, launch the continuation of that. But um, it actually never happened. And I know my father put a lot of things on hold for quite a while so that he could do this with Orson. And uh, they, as you can imagine, had immense respect for each other. In many ways, they were alike. Uh, and I think that uh, Orson knew uh, what my father had and the, um, how electric he was when he performed on stage. And I think that was important to Orson that he wanted to um, cast my father in his next project. But one thing you have to understand, in the 50s, actors were not paid what they're paid now. My father was still, um, uh, you know, he was still uh, early in his career and uh, an actor didn't make a lot of money and he had a family. Uh, I was born and then I uh, don't know if my sister had come along yet. And quite honestly, he waited and waited for Orson. And he finally decided that he, um, that that was it, that he, he uh, actually had to pass on the next project that Orson wanted he, him to do. But I do believe they stayed in touch, yes. And then um, uh, in regards to Stanley Kubrick, yes, I think they, 
it was, they were both at the same studio. So, you know, you talk about lightning stri strikes in the 60s. Um, I, I believe they, um, you know, met each other, but I don't think that there was any, um, I don't think they actually developed a, a friendship. That's, that's all I know, but I know both shows were being shot at exactly the same time. Thanks, Catherine. Alex, Rod, any further comments on? There's, uh, a, stor there's a story about um, the shooting of The Prisoner and 2001 uh, in which a sign was being put on people's doors. They had kept the panther from uh, the scene they did on the soundstage at the beginning of uh, 2001. They were keeping it in one of the dressing rooms and there was a sign on the door that said, large dangerous animal within. And of course that sign got taken down and put on Lagoon's door and put on Alexis Canner's door. And, and, but there really was a large dangerous animal within. And uh, that's the only <laughs> thing I heard about the interaction between the two productions. Okay. I mean, you really, uh, uh, very quickly, uh, and Alex, you touched on this at the uh, forward of uh, the uh, beginning of, of your book. We're talking about this, uh, you know, the, um, the beginning of the, uh, you know, the 60s, I said, but well, it was uh, the end of the 50s, but the actual filming was in, you know, 67. Um, you think about England in that period, it, there was a, what I call a creative revolution. Um, uh, you know, there was some uh, such talented people on all um, aspects um, in, you know, fashion, music, TV, film. It, it was um, a decade of um, high creativity. It was very exciting time to be in London. And it, it was palpable, I think, at the time. And I think that that energy, whatever was happening at that time, fueled all these creative beings. Um, and I think that's why you have, um, you know, such um, shows that came out of that period and are still with us and, and still hold up today. We have a question from Dan, and this is directed to Catherine. Uh, and Dan says, throughout his life, when do you think your father was at his best? Well, wow. <laughs> well, you know, um, maybe I will answer this in a, in a three part. I think that everybody in their life. They have highs and they have lows. I think you can't help but have disappointments and frust frustrations. I know that my father's early, early life, he's often referenced his time at the Sheffield Repertory Company, theatre company, where he met my mother where he um, was a young, young actor and he did uh, many plays over several years in Sheffield. And he's often, I remember him telling me, we were sitting at the kitchen table having, having a, a cup of tea. And he said, I, I would have been quite happy had I remained in Sheffield and continued doing plays at Sheffield Theatre. But, but that said, he, he was destined for something else and his life took on a, a momentum. So creatively, I would say the best of times was the early part of his career leading up to doing The Prisoner uh, he did a couple of incredible theater 
and many award-winning shows on TV. And he was in that creative bubble. There was momentum. And then I think when he came to America, he felt that in a way he had to reinvent himself. So that was the early 70s. And I think that that was a more challenging time for him. And then I think he went through a period of time uh, because he was never seduced by Hollywood in a, you know, a, a Hollywood actor fame and uh, stardom. That, as we all know, was not his thing. So he was trying to find his next project, his next purpose, and where he could put his voice upon. So then I would say the last half of his life or the last third of his life, as he got older, there is something about him that is more accepting and a little more content. And it's around the period of time, I think, when he did Braveheart. And he did another project playing Bernard Shaw. And I think then, as you know, you come nearer to the end of your life, I think he was more resolved and more reflective. He was, you know, he had such control over the vision of the prisoner in the 60s that it, would, it was almost unrealistic that he could do that again, over again. Because as I've said before, and as we know, Lou Grade basically it gave him a free range to do do the show exactly how he wanted to do it. And, you know, now that's unheard of really, uh, because you've got studios and producers and the, there's so many people involved in the making of a series or the making of a film. So um, in answer, that's a long answer and I apologize. So I would say up until the end of the 60s, and then again um, uh, in the mid 90s and the late 90s, and then in the last few years of his life. You know, my parents were together for 60 years. That's unheard of in showbiz. And um, he was as happy as he'd ever been those last few years of his life. So I will leave you with that. Fantastic, thanks, Catherine. Um, I have, have a question. Uh, I think one of the uh, uh, under-recognized elements of The Prisoner that really added uh, to the impact of the series was the music. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on, uh, on the development of the score and the work by Ron Grainer and the uh, the opening theme and closing themes. Uh, I think those, uh, those were so powerful. Uh, and I, I think they, I think it was very synergistic with the, the themes and the various episodes. So I was wondering if uh, uh, Catherine, Alex, Rod, you might comment on the music of The Prisoner. Uh, okay, so I will, uh, what I will say is there were three composers involved. Um, and um, this is a little bit of trivia. I don't have all the names uh, uh, on the tip of my tongue. Um, but I know that the, the last entry was, a, was very close to what they wanted but I know, you know, I mean, I have to be honest, my father was involved in every aspect of the series. Um, um, and he went in the studio uh, with the music and they played the music and he, he kept saying, faster, faster, 
more tempo, more tempo. Got to get that because that opening sequence, the stakes are so high and he already knew what that opening sequence was going to be. And he's walking and he wanted the music to match the pace of his walk. And so um, they finally came up with the music um, and um, it, it, it was something that uh, matches the series so beautifully. And it, it's a score where you can go off on a tangent, which you very often do. And it almost has a little bit of dialogue of its own. And then we all know that the, um, uh, uh, we've got a lot of children's rhymes and um, playful, playfulness to um, kind of describe a moment. And that was all these different branches from the score. But the actual pacing of that opening sequence and the music, that was encouraged by my father. And they worked together and they finally came up with it. And Alex, do you know the name? Uh, do you know the name of uh, the uh, composer? The, the composer of the final score? Yes. Oh, I can't think of it. And I apologize. I should have it at the tip of my tongue. I know there's someone in in the audience Grainer? who uh, knows that. Was that was that Ron Grainer? Ron Grainer. That's right. Yes. Yes. And if, you, and, and if you look at the earlier version of Arrival that's available on one of those DVDs or Blu-ray discs, there's a different score uh, and by a different composer. And Ron Grainer came in apparently yes. quite late, didn't he? Uh, yes, that's right. Yes. Yes. And I have to mention that the uh, Patrick McGowan's predecessor series, uh, Secret Agent or Danger Man, also had a wonderful theme song that was uh, a pop hit in the night. Totally. Secret, Secret Agent Man by Johnny Rivers. That's right. Uh, with a remake, uh, an idiosyncratic remake by Devo uh, many years later that was, uh, uh, that was uh, quite memorable as well. Uh, Emily has uh, another question for you, uh, Catherine, regarding uh, how is your mother doing? Oh, thank you. Well, my mother is, uh, she's a force. Um, I'm not going to tell you how old she is because she'll never forgive me. Um, but she is a very independent woman. She's in good health. Um, and she's still very, well, as, as engaged as you can be right now because we're all being very careful as you, as everyone in the world, we're all being very, very careful, but she is, um, uh, does not have any health issues and uh, she's doing very well, but thank you for asking. All right, we have, we have a question from Steve, a, uh, a, a pretty deep question uh, in which, uh, He's asking, uh, is Patrick McGowan uh, exploring the dual nature of his own art? That is uh, Patrick McGowan versus Patrick McGowan, uh, the scripted character. Uh, and is that kind of duality uh, something that uh, you might be able to comment on? Well, I think that's very perceptive. And I touched on it when I gave my little uh, you know, commentary earlier that um, in in arrival when he arrives and number two has the binder with all his information. The one thing you have to note is that when he gives the date of birth, that's actually my father's date of birth. So that is a little bit of a clue. That wait a minute here. It's a uh, it, it, there is a dualness going on and that I, I, I do think as the prisoner pro, uh, progressed that it became more and more personal. And uh, they, uh, I think they were 
I think it was number six and my father, what they were taking the journey uh, as, as one. And listen, I uh, just something that um, Alex touched on, and I just want to clarify. Um, the truth is that when he pitched the prisoner to Lou Grade, uh, and, and as the story goes, but it is the truth that, you know, he'd done well over 50 episodes of Danger Man's Secret Agent. And he even ended up doing more than that, as we know. He was bored. And he was bored with that character. And there have been a lot of discussions whether that number six is a continuation of John Drake. And um, it's, he did say, I have something new. I want to do a new show. He didn't say, I want to do a continuation. And I think people assume, because it's, a, it's um, John Drake and Secret Agent was a spy thriller, and The Prisoner started as a spy, intrigue, science fiction, thriller. But as we all know, it ended up being something much, much more. So um, uh, I will um, mention, I will, from my perspective, I will say that number six is not a continuation of John Drake. That is my opinion. <laughs> Well, thank you, Catherine. Al Alex, Rod, any further comments on that, uh, that question? I have some things that I think are worth saving at this moment. Uh, if one is a concept that I developed during my commentaries on the prisoner, and that is designated by the phrase despair deprivation. What comes to my mind is that uh, among the various clinical experiences is with patients that uh, had seen the prisoner and were affected by it in a way that we they communicated. Of course, I, I am severely limited in what I can reveal because of my clinical responsibility to safeguard patients' confidentiality. But one thing I can safely reveal is that I learned from them in response to their reactions to the prisoner and how they depicted it. And that is everybody has difficulties in life, sometimes very severe difficulties that in, in, entail uh, some considerable suffering. And those who have that kind of experience in life, often develop despair. And they come to psychiatrists with hope of getting relief from that kind of despair. Sometimes, luckily, they are successful. And what comes to my mind is that a group of those people who had been deeply affected by the, seeing the prisoner were relieved of despair and reported that either in the individual therapy sessions and sometimes in groups. One peculiar and very interesting thing to me is that 
my hope is, has always been, of course, that I could relieve through psychotherapy, sometimes psychoanalysis, the despair of those who suffered in it. And sometimes I was successful and sometimes I was not. In general, I thought that when I was able to help patients get relief from their despair, that they would be contented and happy uh, and uh, go on to have satisfying living experiences because of that improvement. That proved to be the case in many patients' experiences, but not all. And that group that didn't have that experience is what triggered my understanding that they were experiencing despair over the loss of their suffering. And that was very interesting to me. I believe that it's a more common phenomenon that many people are startled by and don't believe. Well, Rod? Goes, I, think, I, think, I think there is time. I, I, did you want me to continue? Well, Rod, uh, I, I want to thank you for those uh, very insightful comments. I think it's, uh, it's a wonderful way uh, to wrap things up. We've come to the top of the hour. And I'd like to thank our guest speakers, Alex Cox, Catherine McGowan, and Rod Gorney. Um, I also want to thank the people who really made this possible. Many thanks to Debbie Nielsen and Julia Lupton from UCI Illuminations, to Will Alvarez and Kyle Good for expert media support. And, and uh, thanks to my wife, Jan, for additional technical support. I'd like to thank Debs McDougall from Six of One, the Prisoner Appreciation Society for endorsing and publicizing this event. And thanks to Rick Davey from The Unmutual for his support. And thanks to all of you for attending this event. And of course, be seeing you. Be seeing you. Be, be seeing you. Be seeing you. <laughs> be seeing you. <laughs>